know about that. Uh, you might say Resurrection Sunday, and that's fine too. But it is the Lord's Day, and we celebrate the Resurrection every single Sunday. Not just once a year, but 52 times a year, every Sunday, um, Christians gather to celebrate his resurrection. Because man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God, please take your Bible and open it to Luke chapter 24. We take a break from our series in Matthew um, to, to think about the resurrection very specifically and directly in Luke chapter 24. We want to think about the resurrection story. So turn there, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 49. It's a longer section. I'll read verses 1 through 49, and then we're going to tell this story and then meditate on this story and think about four things we can take from this passage for, for us this, this Sunday. So Luke chapter 24, if this is your first time looking at a Bible, the 24 is the big number, and the small numbers are the verse numbers. We'll begin in verse 1 of Luke 24. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb bringing the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling clothes. So the women were terrified and bowed down to the ground. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Asked the men. He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, It is necessary for the Son of Man to be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and rise on the third day? And they remembered his words. Returning from the tomb, they reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Mary Magdalene, Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and other women were with them were telling the apostles these things. But these words seemed like nonsense to them, and they did not believe the women. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. When he stooped to look in, he saw only linen cloths, so he went away amazed at what had happened. Now that same day, two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. Together they were discussing everything that had taken place. And while they were discussing and arguing, Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them. But they were prevented from recognizing him. Then he asked them, what is this dispute that you are having with, with each other as you are walking? And they stopped walking and looked discouraged. The one, the one named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that happened there in these days? What things? He asked them. So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, powerful in action and speech before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Besides all this, it's the third day since all these things happened. Moreover, some women from our group astounded us, they arrived early at the tomb, and when they didn't find his body, they came and reported that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with, who, some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it was just as the women had said, but they didn't see him. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them all the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. They came near the village where they were going and he gave the impression that he was going farther. But they urged him, stay with us because it's almost evening and now the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. It was as he reclined at the table with them that he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then 
their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, weren't our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? That very hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those with them gathered together, who said, the Lord has truly been raised and appeared to Simon. Then they began to describe what had happened on the road and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. As they were saying these things, he himself stood in their midst. He said to them, peace to you. But they were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. Why are you troubled? He asked them. And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you, as you can see I have. Having said this, he showed them his hands and feet. But while they were still amazed and in disbelief because of their joy, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? So they gave him a piece of a broiled fish. And he took it and ate in their presence. He told them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He also said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name to all nations. Beginning at Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. And look, I am sending you what my father promised. As for you, stay in the city until you are empowered from on high. This is the word of the Lord. May the word of Christ dwell richly among us. Father, that's our prayer now. Open our minds to understand Luke 24. Open our minds to understand the Old Testament and how it pointed to, to the Lord Jesus as Lord, as the, as the crucified and risen Lord. Help us, Lord, to grasp these things. Change us by them, we pray. And Father, we pray that with the power from on high, from your Holy Spirit, not only that we would grow and be changed, but that even those who are not yet Christian here among us would become Christian today that you would open their eyes by the power of Christ's resurrection and by the power of the Bible, the Word, and by the power of your Spirit. Give them life, resurrection, eternal life. This morning we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you remember the last time you had a really, really long and tiring day? I said something like that this week to my wife, Frances. We celebrated City's birthday this past week, and it was our family day, our day off. Her birthday fell on our family day, so on Thursday we celebrated her birthday from the morning. We did some morning events, just our family, and then we had extended family in the morning, and then we um, tried to relax a little bit in the afternoon to get ready for the evening for a dessert celebration. And by the end of the whole day, I laid down on my bed, and Francis was telling me to take a shower, and I didn't want to take a shower. I was so tired, and I haven't been that tired in a really long time. I was like, I am so tired, I just want to sleep. When was the last time you had a really, really long and tiring day? Sundays are joyful, long, and sometimes for some of you tiring days. So what is your Sunday routine? Is it a long day for you? Maybe it's a relaxing and chill day for you. I don't know. Some of you, everyone here has different practices on Sunday. As a pastor here for the members of BBC, I regularly recommend to you as my pastoral expectation, if you're going to pursue normal spiritual health, that you take the whole day and you set aside the whole day for the Lord Jesus and his body, his bride, the church. And so what I would encourage uh, members in the members' class is come to Sunday divinity class. And, and right now we're studying church history, so learn about church history and learn about theology from the divinity class at 9 a.m. And then at 10 o'clock, we start our preparation singing. At 10.15, we start our morning gathering. And it's not a short gathering like other churches it's not a short sermon, it's a longer sermon, and it's a longer gathering that we have uh, on Sundays. We start around 10 and we end past 12. So we have a long gathering. 
And then after that, you start greeting each other and talking to each other. And then you get hungry and you got to eat. And so some of you go out and eat with other people and hang out. Some of you go home on a normal Sunday. And then we come back at what time? Anyone know? We come back at 5 o'clock p.m. in the evening to share blessings and praises and prayer requests, to hear scripture read, to pray together as a church family. We hear a shorter message. Sometimes we take the Lord's Supper in the morning. Sometimes we take the Lord's Supper in the evening. And then we hang out after the, after the evening gathering, and you hang out as long as you can until your kids can't take it anymore or your stomachs can't take it anymore and you're hungry. And so you got, or we turn off the lights and just say you have to leave. And so you leave. And then for some of us, the pastoral interns and I, we get together after dinner and we do a Sunday review for another two hours. And that's Sunday, the Lord's Day, a typical Sunday. And I love Sundays. I love the Lord's Day. I love what it does to my life and it provides a backbone for my own spiritual life and my family and for our church family to build off the rest of our week and the rest of our lives. What a glorious day Sunday is for those who are in Christ now, Luke here takes us back to the very first Lord's Day, and it was also a long Sunday. If I could describe this Sunday in one word, I would use the word whiplash. It was a whiplash type Sunday. It was emotional from start to finish. From the very, very beginning, before that Sunday, Jesus was crucified. He was betrayed on Thursday night. He was arrested on Thursday night. He was tried throughout the night until Friday morning. He's hanging on the cross by 9 a.m. And for six hours, he's hanging on the cross, the first three hours in a day like this. And then for the last three hours, in pitch black darkness in Jerusalem, a strange and supernatural darkness seeming, covering the land. He dies, he's buried, and the hopes of the disciples, not just the 11 apostles, um, minus Judas, but the disciples, the other followers, uh, followers of Jesus, their hopes were dashed. They were depressed. They were down. They were discouraged. They were sad. They were heartbroken. Their hearts shattered to thousands of pieces. It was an exhilarating two years. It was an exhilarating three years. Unlike anything anyone else has ever experienced in human history, following this man who was claiming to be the Messiah and the Savior of the world, the Lord, the fulfillment of the scriptures. And then he dies. He fails. It's a pitiful failure. He's murdered, hanging naked on a cross. And so they were discouraged. Saturday they were discouraged, and here comes the Lord's Day. Sunday morning. It starts with deep discouragement, depression, and feeling down and sad. Well, that early morning, the sun rose at 6.35 here in Bellflower this morning. You had a bunch of women here this first Lord's Day morning, maybe around 6, if, if the sun was going to rise at 6.35, maybe around 6 o'clock. They're, they're making their way in dark towards the tomb because they, want, they didn't have a chance on Friday to fully embalm the body and put all the spices. It says in John that there were 70 pounds of spices and, and, um, and um, things to put around and to, to, um, to prepare the body of Jesus for burial. And they didn't have time because the sun was going down and it was a Sabbath day, Friday evening. And so they couldn't finish. So Sunday morning, they waited the whole Sabbath until Sunday morning where they can finally come and now prepare the body for the rest of its decay in the grave. And so they get there, six, six o'clock early morning, the sun is starting to come up. They get to the tomb and there's a big rock a big boulder that's guarding the tomb that's closed over the tomb and they look and the the boulder is the stone is rolled away it's open that's strange there's, there's a bunch of women going there how are we going to move the boulder how are we going to move the stone i don't know let's just figure it out let's just go so they go and it's moved away so then they go inside and they try what what they go inside what you know of, of course curious and startled they go inside and there's no body there and so now they're shocked, they're amazed, the tomb is empty, there's nobody there, and then all of a sudden, two men appear there in dazzling clothes. Dazzling clothes, what does that look like? I don't want to tell you what I'm imagining in my mind, but two men, we later find out as angels, in dazzling clothes. And so they, they come and they say, why are, you, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Are you looking for Jesus? He's not here, he's risen. Remember what he told you when he was still in Galilee? He told you that he was going to be betrayed by sinful men, 
that he would be crucified on the cross. And he told you that on the third day he would rise. Do you remember that? And they're like, oh yeah, I remember that. Can't believe I forgot. I remember that now. So they remember that. And they run back to the 11. They got to go to the apostles. You got to tell somebody this, right? So they run back to the 11. They tell the apostles, Jesus is alive, I guess. I don't know. I didn't see it. Did you see him? No, I didn't see him. But I saw two men and they had these dazzling clothes. And they reminded us, remember Jesus told us he was going to be betrayed? He told us he was going to be crucified? He told us he was going to rise on the third day? And to them, they're all, that is nonsense. What are you talking about? So to the, to, the, to the men there and to the others there, they looked at the women as if they were speaking nonsense. They didn't believe. Now, Peter was there, and John, John tells us, and Peter was so curious and astounded and startled that he just took off running. He took off running where he was in Jerusalem to find the tomb and then to, to see if those things were true. He goes there and he looks, he sees the tomb, it's empty. He looks inside, this is Sunday morning, he looks inside and it's empty. And he's just amazed at these things. That's Sunday morning. There's three parts to the story, that was part one. Sunday morning. Now we have Sunday late morning, actually maybe more Sunday afternoon. And then we have Sunday evening of this Lord's Day. That's Sunday morning. Okay, so later, let's fast forward a few hours. That's, who knows, uh, 6.30, maybe 7 o'clock in the morning. That's what, that's what happened at around 7, 7.30 in the morning. So they're talking about these things. And then in Sunday after, let's just say afternoon, after 12 or so, Cleopas and uh, one of the other disciples, they go together and they're walking to Emmaus, a seven-mile hike from Jerusalem to Emmaus. So Cleopas and his, and his, and his friend, they're, they're walking, they're disciples of Jesus. They were there in that room with the, when the women came. And so they're talking and they're arguing with each other. They're like, man, what happened? This is crazy. Just, this is so sad. But what are the women talking about? Is Mary right? Is Joanna right? Who, who knows? But uh, he, I do remember him saying that, but I don't know if this is true. Like, this is just, no, this is crazy. So they're arguing with each other. So apparently they have different views about what's going on and interpreting all this information that's flooding them in this whiplash of emotion. And then Jesus, undercover Jesus, shows up on the scene. Undercover Jesus. Maybe he has a fake mustache. We don't know. He, he, uh, they don't recognize him for whatever reason. So there's Jesus walking, and he's like, what are you guys talking about? What are you guys talking about? Uh, what happened? What? And they're like, what do you mean what happened? Don't you, are you the only person in the whole city of Jerusalem who doesn't know what happened? And he starts telling them, they start telling him about the events. They start telling undercover Jesus. This would be like, now I, I was telling Francis last night, I was telling her about some of the members' ages in our church, about how old they were during 9-11. Um, so some of you were little kids during 9-11. Um, some of you might not have even been born. Um, uh, during 9-11, but um, so this would be like when the two towers fell in New York City on a Tuesday, that was Tuesday morning, on Thursday, people, someone in New York City not knowing what happened. Out of the millions in New York City, like, can you imagine finding someone who didn't know, like someone who was like a grown person, not a child, or, you know, a grown person who's just there and has been in the city for the last few days? Can you imagine someone not knowing what happened? That's just shocking. What do you mean what happened? Everybody, everybody knows what happened. And so here it is in Jerusalem. Everybody knows what happened. This man, Jesus, who was powerful, he was a prophet. He spoke powerfully. Nobody taught like this man. This guy casted out demons. He was raising the dead. He was healing the sick. Blind people were seeing again when they lost their sight. Even people who were born blind, who never saw in their whole lives, all of a sudden had eyes to see. Sick people were being healed. Sinners were drawn to him. The best scholars could not confuse him or confound him or, or, or catch him in any way. This was the greatest man we had ever seen. And crowds were following this guy. We thought this was the guy. This was the Messiah. He was going to come and fulfill the promises and we were going to have the kingdom again. Did you not hear any of this? And then, and then he was... He was um, arrested, he was crucified Friday morning, and he was killed. They killed him, they executed him. Imagine that, a public execution. I was just thinking, what would that be today? It would almost be like, you know, I don't know who's the mo who are the most famous people in the world today. But pick someone who you think is well-known. You know, you could just say, um, 
you know, you could say the president of the United States or a former president of the United States, uh, Donald Trump or Barack Obama. Imagine if they were if they were executed publicly. Can you imagine that? If they were executed publicly, just how how shocking that would be that someone that well known and that powerful was executed. And you could just go to YouTube and just look it up and look up the execution. It was shocking. Do you not know what's been happening? Where were you? And then, and then they say this to, to undercover Jesus. Not only that, whoever you are, whatever your name is, um, this all happened on Friday, and it's the third day. <laughs> I love that they say that in this comment. It's the third day, and we still, like, we're, we're still confused. It's crazy what's happening. And then Jesus rebukes them. You fools. You guys are foolish. Are you so slow of heart that you can't believe what the prophets and what Moses wrote in the law? That these things had to happen? That the Messiah had to suffer? He had to die in order to enter into glory? And so undercover Jesus starts with Moses and goes to the prophets and starts explaining from the Bible how all of these things pointed to the fact that the Messiah, whoever the Messiah would be, he had to suffer. So this undercover Jesus saying, I don't know who that guy is, but whoever he is, he had to, if he was the Messiah, he had to suffer. That's not surprising. Just read your Bible. And so they're listening and listening. And so as he's talking about himself, really undercover Jesus talking about himself, they make it to Emmaus and they get to the village where they were headed, where Cleopas and his little homie were headed. They get there. And so there they are in the village and Jesus pretends to keep walking along. He's just walking along. And so they're like, wait, hold on. Why don't you stay with us? It's getting dark outside. So what time does the sun set? Uh, probably around 6.30 or 7 p.m. tonight, the sun sets. So maybe it's getting around 7, 6.30. Hey, the sun's going to set in an hour or so. Just stay here for the night. So undercover Jesus says, okay, stay here for the night. So undercover Jesus stays with them. They have a meal together. They have dinner together. And then Jesus takes the bread, blesses the bread, breaks it, and gives it to them. And the lights turn on. <gasps> this is Jesus. Now these, Cleopas and his friend were not there at the Last Supper. It was only the 12 disciples. But they were probably there when Jesus took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and fed 5,000. Took the bread, broke it, and fed, blessed it, and then fed 4,000. Or they were probably with Jesus with several meals. No one ever took bread and blessed the bread the way Jesus blessed the bread. No one ever broke it the way Jesus broke it. You know, uh, just a sh short side application. Sometimes we pray so quick for our meals just because we want to eat that our prayer is, is trite and meaningless personally and thoughtless. It's personally meaningless and thoughtless. It's a routine. For Jesus, I could imagine, every time he blessed the bread, it was the deepest, sincerest worship. And they saw it. And so there it is. He blesses the bread. He breaks it. He gives it to them. The lights go on. That's Jesus. As soon as, and then they look to do a double take. And as they look to Jesus, as soon as the lights go on, guess what? He's gone. He's vanished. What? what? What is happening? What is happening? And so they're freaked out. It's already probably dark by, by now. So that's, that's uh, scene two, the walk to Emmaus. And then they run in the dark back to Jerusalem, seven miles. Let's go back to Jerusalem. We can't stay here for the night. This is crazy. That was Jesus the whole time walking with us. It's probably, if we're walking seven miles, maybe a three-hour walk. We just walked for three hours with this man. He explained the Bible to us. He broke the bread. This was actually Jesus. Oh, no, no. We got to go back to Jerusalem right now. So the two of them get up and they run back to Jerusalem. Seven mile run back to Jerusalem. And now we're at scene three. It's nighttime. It's dark. And as they get there to Jerusalem, they get to where the 11 are in the room. And guess what the 11 are talking about? Jesus is alive. He showed himself to Peter. Now, we don't have any record of this in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. We just have the reference to it here. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 5, it says that Jesus first showed himself to Peter. So here they are. They're saying, he showed himself to Peter. He's alive. And so as, they, as they're talking about this, Cleopas and his friend come to the, to the room, 
they're there with the, with the 11 others. They want to tell their story. They're hearing that, wait, wait, you saw him? And then like, well, guess what, guys? We saw him too. We walked with him for like three hours. And then we ate with him. And he broke the bread. He blessed it. And when he broke it and blessed it, we knew immediately it had to be him. And then we looked at him, and then he was gone. He vanished. And they're like, oh, what? That's crazy. And then they hear this voice. Peace to you. And they look, and who's in the room? Jesus. They, just, they were just talking about how he disappeared out of nowhere. They hear his voice out of nowhere. Peace to you. They turn, and who's standing right there? Jesus. And so they look at Jesus, and they're startled. They're shocked. They're afraid. So they, they back up, and they start, to, they start to feel afraid and joyful, and they're trying to process all these things. Remember the, the whiplash of the events, and now they're there with Jesus. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. I'm not a ghost. Ghosts don't have flesh and blood. Look, look, look at my flesh. Look at, look at my bones. A, a, a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones like I have. Don't be scared, guys. It's me. I, yeah, I showed myself to Peter. I showed my, yeah, hey, what's up, Cleopas? Good to see you again. Don't be afraid. It's me. This is me. Flesh and bone, Jesus. It's me. Your master, your Lord. Does anyone have anything to eat? I'm kind of hungry. You guys got any fish or something? Anything to eat? Oh, we got some broiled fish. And so they take out broiled fish. They give it to Jesus. He eats. And then he explains to them. Maybe while he's still chewing on his food, I can imagine. <laughs> Jesus starts to explain to them that it was necessary. He said, I told you guys this. Why are you guys shocked? I, I you know, as he's eating and drinking, I told you guys this when I was still alive. I told you I was going to be betrayed, right? Remember that? Yes. What did I say was going to happen after that? Did I tell you I was going to be crucified? Yes or no? Yeah, I told you that. Yes, I did. And then I told you on the third day I was going to what? What did I tell you I was going to do? I was going to what? Rise from the dead. Here I am. I, 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 like, why are you guys surprised? I told you these things not once, at least three times. I told you over and over that this was going to happen. And then he said, this is, and not only did I tell you this, this is what's written in the Bible, which is the Hebrew Bible, the, the Jewish Bible, the Old Testament, now for us. This is what was written in the Bible, that the Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached and proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. He says, you guys are witnesses to this. You're witnesses to these things. And look, I'm going to send you power from on high. Wait for that power. Wait here for that power. And when you get it, you're going to be my witnesses. And so that's the end of the story, the resurrection story, according to Luke. That's the first Lord's Day. That's, wh that's, a, that's a long day, right? A long day from, uh, from whiplash, from emotionally discouraged to at the end, joyful, hopeful, with a sense of purpose and meaning, all your, I mean, your, your heart broken into a thousand pieces, and not only that, but almost brought back together in a stronger, more hopeful way than even before that Friday, right? What a weekend. And what a Lord's Day 2,000 years ago. You know what I was thinking? We are going to actually get to, I mean, some of us here, Lord willing, if Christ doesn't come, will be alive during, at 2030, which Christ either died 30 AD or 33 which will be the actual 2000th anniversary, either 30 or 33. It's one of those two years, but we're, we're going to get to the, the 2000th year celebration of Christ's life, death, and resurrection, which is amazing if the Lord tarries. But we pray, Maranatha, may the Lord come. Okay, so that's the story of what happened. Now, given that story, you've heard it twice now. I read the story to you, and I just told you the story of this first Lord's Day. I want to draw your attention to four things to remember this Easter Sunday, okay? Four things, then we'll be done. Just four, um, four things for you to, to keep in your mind this Lord's Day. Number one, the tomb is empty. The tomb is empty. Number two, the scriptures and prophecies have been fulfilled. Number three, Jesus opens minds to understand the scriptures. And number four, Jesus makes you his witness. Jesus makes you his witness. I'll say them again. Number one, the tomb is empty. Number two, the prophecies are fulfilled. Number three, Jesus opens minds to understand. And number four, 
Jesus made you his witnesses. All right, let's go through these um, briefly, these four things. Number one, the tomb is empty. Now, this is good news. Do you know what the word gospel means? The word gospel means good. Good what? Good news, not good advice. When we talk about good advice, now we all can use some good advice. Good advice give, it gives us information on what to do in the future, what is upcoming, right? We get advice about what we're currently facing into the future. Good news is information not about the future, but about the, the past, right? If we tell you uh, the two towers fell down and two airplanes hit the towers, we're not, that's not advice. That's news. That's a, a, an occurrence, an event that happened. The gospel is not advice. It's news. And it's good news. And what's the good news? The tomb is empty. Jesus died for sinners and rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. So here are the three things that, you, that are true, that we know. If you're a Christian or even if you're not a Christian, you might want to pay attention here because what we're saying is that Jesus actually physically rose from the dead. Not resuscitated. Jesus resuscitated Lazarus and the, the widow's son and the, um, the Jewish leader's daughter, Jairus' daughter. Jesus resuscitated them and they died again. No, what we're saying is Jesus actually went, not he died and then came back from death. He went, he died and then went through death into a glorified body. He didn't take death and then kind of touch death, come back and then have to go to death again. No, he went right through death. He absorbed death and then went through death to the other side of death with a glorified body. And what we're saying, if you're not a Christian, is that Jesus is the Savior who died for your sins and rose from the dead, so you need to believe in him. Now, um, there, here are the three facts. There's an empty tomb. There were eyewitnesses who said they saw Jesus, and these eyewitnesses were scared and hiding, and now they were courageous and believing. If you take those three things, which are facts, okay, these are facts whether you're a Christian or not. The tomb is empty. Nobody disputes that. Number two, uh, followers who were scared claim that they saw him. We just read you one story. And then number three, these scared, um, these scared, confused, timid followers became so courageous in their belief that they died for, that they were willing to die for their faith. Those are three facts, Christian or non-Christian. Those are three facts. Now, what I'm saying is that if you take those three facts, there is no reasonable explanation for those three things being true except the fact that Jesus actually rose from the dead. Okay, so let me give you some alternative theories. One alternative theory was he resuscitated. He did not actually um, die, but he almost died. And then Jesus kind of crawled out of the grave. Like he, he was almost dead, but not quite dead. He was in the tomb laying down. He kind of woke up and then he moved somehow in almost being dead. He moved the big boulder and then he showed himself to the disciples and they're like, man, he's glorified. And so that's, that's what happened is that Jesus never really died. Uh, that wouldn't work because how was he going to roll the boulder? Well, you say, well, he's Jesus, right? Well, that's if you believe in him. But not only that, for him rolling over the boulder, but then for them to be like worshiping him as this glorified, powerful savior, if he's like pretty much dead and like barely walking, that's not going to convince people to die for him. So that doesn't make sense. A second idea is that the disciples stole the body and, they, um, and, the, and so there's a conspiracy that the disciples made up that Jesus rose from the dead, which is a lie. He didn't, he didn't actually rise from the dead. Uh, his body was stolen. If that's true, then why would they die for a lie? I mean, you, you lie to gain from the lie. The, the church, when they died, was not this powerful force all around the world. The church was still small and pitiful by world standards. They were not prestigious in their deaths. So why die for this movement? You don't, they didn't know what the future is going to hold. So um, it doesn't make sense that they stole the body. Why would they die for that? And number three, a third theory is that they had hallucinations. But usually when you hallucinate, that actually confirms death. If you're hallucinating about someone who, who died, that, that they're actually dead when you're hallucinating. Not only that, there, are, there aren't group hallucinations where they all have the same exact hallucination. Not only that, there were several appearances of Jesus, not just once. We just talked about two here. There's a lot more if you read through Matthew, Mark, and, and John, as well as 1 Corinthians 15 and other passages. You can find other appearances of Jesus. So group hallucinations doesn't work. There's only one explanation for the fact that there's an empty tomb, 
people saying that they saw him, and the fact that they were bold and courageous, willing to die for Jesus. The only reasonable explanation is that he actually rose from the dead. So that's the good news. That is the news. Jesus died for sinners, and he, he was raised from, he rose from the dead. So if you're not a Christian, I have a question for you. Do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Will you believe the message? You're a sinner who needs a savior. You're someone who's going to die. You need someone to not only save you from your sins, but from death. You need someone who will take you through death to the other side with a glorified body. And there's only one who's done that, and that's Jesus Christ. So that's number one. The tomb is empty. Number two, the scriptures and the prophecies have been fulfilled. Now it says, look at, go back to your Bible here. Look at verse 27. So Jesus says it's necessary for the Messiah to suffer. Verse 27 says, then beginning with Moses. What books did Moses write, somebody? What books did Moses write? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible, the Torah or the Pentateuch. Jesus wrote, I mean, Moses wrote those books. So beginning with Moses' books, and then with all the prophets, Jesus interpreted them, the things concerning himself. When you get to verse 20, or verse 44, it says, every, Jesus said, everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So what is Jesus saying? In my death and resurrection, the scriptures have been fulfilled. So let me just take you through some Old Testament scriptures that have been fulfilled in Jesus. Does the Bible actually say that Jesus is going to rise on the third day? Not exactly, not explicitly, not like it says a, a virgin's going to give birth. But there are pointers to, to Jesus in the Old Testament. Do you know that Jesus is the fulfillment of the temple? You guys know that, right, as Christians? He's the fulfill The temple pointed to Jesus. The priesthood pointed to Jesus. The sacrifices pointed to Jesus. There are certain things in the Bible that point to Jesus. Adam points to Jesus. Noah points to Jesus. So does third day point to Jesus? And does resurrection, is resurrection the Old Testament? Let me just give you a machine gun list of texts here, just briefly, okay? So just listen up here. Number one, in Daniel 12, 2, and John Lee's going to preach on that tonight, the scriptures speak of a final resurrection. Okay, that's number one. Number two, um, in Psalm 16, King David wrote Psalm 16, and he said, Lord, you will not allow your Holy One to see decay. You won't let your Holy One, his body, your Messiah, is David writing in some sense about himself, that you won't let me see decay. You're not going to let me die. Well, David did die. But then in Acts chapter 2, we find out Peter says that this was actually talking most finally about Jesus because Jesus' body never decayed. It never rotted. It was only in the tomb from Friday to, to Sunday morning. So Psalm 16 verse 10 is another pointer to the resurrection. So that fulfills the Psalms. And then in Hosea 6 verses 1 through 2, it talks about how Israel, is going, Israel the nation, is going to be raised on the third day. Israel's going to be raised on the third day, the nation? What does that mean? Well, if you read on in Hosea 11, 1, and then Hosea 14, Hosea starts to make a distinction. Well, in Hosea 14, verses 4 through 6, Hosea makes a distinction between Israel and an Israel who's going to save Israel and lead Israel. And so maybe that Israel was the one who was going to be raised on the third day. And in him, all others would be raised in him. That's Hosea 6, 1 through 2. Do you guys remember Abraham was about to sacrifice his son named Isaac? And so he was told this by God. And then it says in Genesis 22, verse 4, on the third day, Abraham saw the hill where he was about to sacrifice his son. And did he sacrifice his son? Did he kill Isaac? Yes or no? No, he didn't. But he took him out. And then it says in Hebrews 11 that it's like he got his son back from the dead. Because he counted his son as good as dead on that third day. But, and maybe on the third day uh, of the travels when he got there. So for three days, he's like, my son's going to die. And so when his son doesn't die, Abraham getting his son back off the altar was almost like him receiving him back from the dead because he was considering his son as good as dead because God gave the order. So there's Genesis 22. There's Moses. And then we, we learned this from Matthew 12 last, uh, two weeks ago. Jesus said the sign of Jonah... Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for how, how many days? Three days and three nights. And Jesus said, so will the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. So Jesus is saying, Jonah 
and him being the fish pointed to my resurrection on the third day. And then the Passover lamb, of course they had to suffer. It was necessary. The Passover lamb was killed so that you wouldn't have to be killed. On the Day of Atonement in October, that, that sacrifice is killed so that the nation doesn't have to be killed. Don't you, don't you see that sacrifice is necessary? Death and suffering is necessary? And then you get to Isaiah 53. If you want to, you could turn there in your Bible. Our brother uh, Jim Castro read it for us. Isaiah 53, look at verse 3. If you look at verses 3 through 9, man, this is a 700-year-old prophecy, 700 years before Jesus. Look at verse 3. Look at verses 3 through 9. The, this prophet is saying that someone has to die. It's necessary. Look, verse 3. He's going to be despised and rejected by men. Verse 4, he's going to bear our sicknesses. He's going to be, um, they're going to be thinking of him as struck down by God and afflicted. In verse 5, he's going to be pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquity, and our punishment for our peace was on him. And we're going to be healed by this sacrifice, sacrifice this person's wounds. It says in verse 6 that the Lord laid on him, has punished him for the iniquity of us all. In verse 7, this, this one that is being spoken of by the prophet, he will be oppressed and afflicted. He won't open his mouth. Like a lamb led to slaughter, this one is going to be slaughtered. In verse 8, he's going to be taken away because of oppression and judgment. Um, he's going to be cut off from the land of the living. He's going to die. And he's going to be struck because of the people's rebellion. Verse 9, he's going to be buried in a grave. With a, um, not, um, he was assigned to the grave with the wicked because that's where all the people go. They just take all these criminals who are crucified and throw them in a, in a mass tomb, a mass burial, but not him. He was assigned that, but he was with a rich man at his death in a different tomb because he had done no violence and he had not spoken deceitfully. So is someone supposed to suffer, yes or no? According to the 700-year-old prophecy, is someone supposed to suffer, yes or no? Is someone supposed to be oppressed, yes or no? Is someone supposed to be killed? Yes or no? Is someone supposed to be buried? Yes or no? Yes, it's necessary. 700 years ago, Isaiah wrote about this. And would he live again? Yes or no? Look at verse 10. The Lord was pleased to crush him severely. And when you, God, make him a guilt offering, he, the one who was killed, will see his seed. God will prolong the, his, his day. And by his hand, the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. Do you see what's going on in verse 10? Not only will he be killed and buried, God will prolong his life. How do you prolong his life if he's dead and buried? He has to what? Rise from the dead. And so Jesus is going through Moses and Genesis. And he's going through Psalms and David. He's going through Hosea and Isaiah and other prophets. And he's saying, look. He had to die. He had to suffer. He had to be buried. He had to take the guilt and sins of his people on himself. And he had to rise. He would have his days prolonged. Don't be surprised. The scriptures have been fulfilled. There is hope. God's word said these things. And they happened just as God promised and prophesied. Question for all of you this morning, this Easter. Will you believe God's words? Do you believe God's words? The tomb is empty. The scriptures are fulfilled. Third, Jesus opens minds to understand the scriptures. Three times he told them he was going to die and rise, and they forgot it. But when, they, when the angels in dazzling clothes, maybe it was the dazzling clothes that, jol that jolted their memory, right? The angels in the dazzling clothes tell the women that he said he was going to die? Did they remember that? Yes or no? They remembered it. And they remembered he said he would rise on the third day. So first, they couldn't remember it. The uh, Cleopas and his friend couldn't recognize him. Jesus was teaching them the scriptures, but they couldn't connect the dots. Then you get to um, the last part of Sunday night, and Jesus is there with his disciples, and he's telling them the scriptures, but they still don't get it. Look at verse 44. Jesus told them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Do they get it yet? Yes or no? No, they don't get it yet. So what does he do in verse 45? Then he what? He opens their minds to understand the scriptures. So here's the third point. 
Jesus opens minds to understand script, the scriptures. It's not just an intellectual thing, it's a spiritual thing. We need Jesus to open our minds to understand the scripture. Undercover Jesus could not be recognized because Jesus did not open their eyes to recognize him. In their sin, in their belief, in their disbelief, in their doubting, they could not see Jesus. It's all there. The truth is all there. It makes perfect, reasonable, rational, historical sense. But until Jesus opens our eyes, we can't understand the scriptures. There was one Jewish rabbi um, that Dr. Varner wrote in his book, Passionate About the Passion Week, a rabbi who wrote in uh, last century, in the 1900s, making an argument. He's a Jew. He made an argument that Jesus actually did rise from the dead. And that in the Hebrew scriptures, it makes sense that there is a prophecy that we shouldn't be surprised that a Jewish man can rise from the dead. So this Jewish rabbi makes that argument and still doesn't believe in Jesus as Lord. <laughs> he wrote a whole book about how he believes it's totally plausible and biblical that Jesus rose from the dead. But that doesn't mean he's the Messiah. Isn't that crazy? I mean, praise God that he made that argument. I think he's right. It is reasonably true that Jesus rose from the dead. But until Jesus opens our minds to understand not only what happened, but what it means that Jesus is the Lord and treasure and savior of your life. You won't see him for who he is. You won't repent and trust in him, but you need to, and you ought to. So let me give you two applications here for Christians. First, second Timothy two, seven says this, Paul says to Timothy, think over what I say, because the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Think about what I say, because the Lord will give you understanding. So what's the first application here? If Jesus opens your minds, what do you need to do? Keep reading the Bible. Keep thinking. Don't be lazy. Don't, well, God has to open my mind, so I'm not going to read my Bible today. I'll wait for God to open my mind. Nope. If you do that, you are guilty and accountable for your disparaging of God's word. Think hard about what the Bible says, and the Lord will give you understanding. Second prayer, or second application is prayer. Don't just think hard about the Bible, pray about it. Pray Psalm 119, 18. Open my eyes to see wonderful things, to contemplate wonderful things in your word. Pray Psalm 119, 36 and 37, which says, turn my heart, incline my heart to your testimonies and not to material gain. Turn my eyes from looking at vain, empty things and give me life in your ways. Pray that prayer. Ask God to give you life. Ask him to open your eyes, to make you want to understand his word. Okay, so the tomb is empty. That's good news. Number two, the scriptures have been fulfilled. The prophecies have been fulfilled. So trust the Bible. Number three, Jesus opens your minds to understand the scriptures. So read hard and pray hard. And number four, and lastly, Jesus made you witnesses. Look at verse 46, 47, and 48. Jesus said, this is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name to all nations. Beginning at Jerusalem, you are witnesses to these things. Brothers and sisters, Jesus made you witnesses. He made them witnesses. They were eyewitnesses. Not only did they hear Jesus, they saw Jesus. They were eyewitnesses. Beginning in Jerusalem, they started telling people. What are they proclaiming? You guys see what they're proclaiming in verse 20, verse 47? What are they proclaiming? Repentance for the forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name. That's your message. Okay, brothers and sisters, if you're a Christian, this is your message to non-Christians. Repentance for the forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name. That's your message. According to Luke 24, 47. Repentance. For the forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name. That is our message as witnesses to the lost. You need to tell someone, to, tell someone this week, you can have your sins forgiven. Tell a non-Christian this week, your sins can be forgiven. If you repent, turn from your sin, and declare war on your sin, and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He died for sinners. He rose on a Sunday. God is holy, and you will be judged for your sins. God will hold you accountable. But Jesus died for your sins and rose from the, from the dead so that if you repent, you can be forgiven of your sins in the name of Jesus, the risen Lord. Trust in Jesus. Tell some non-Christian this week, you don't have to be overwhelmed by your guilt. You don't have to be crushed by your shame. 
There is repentance for the forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name. That's good news. Brothers and sisters, I want you to look at another Christian this week, maybe even today, this Sunday, who's feeling guilty of their sin. They've confessed sin to you, or they don't want to confess sin to you, and you ask them how they're doing, and then they confess sin to you. I want you to look at them in the eye and say, I have good news for you. There is repentance for the forgiveness of your sins this week in Jesus' name. Give the gospel to a Christian. Witness to the goodness of God in forgiving sins through repentance in Jesus' name. You are witnesses of this. Jesus has made you a witness. So Christian, will you proclaim repentance for the forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name? Church family, will we work together? Will we continue to stay committed to each other collectively so that as a church family, we spend our lives as a church to propagate this message, this good news, that there's repentance for the forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name? Will we do that, BBC? Lastly, if you're not a Christian, will you receive the forgiveness of sins? Will you repent from your sins today? And will you repent from your righteousness and your religiosity and your, your version of Christianity or whatever religion you have? Will you repent from your religion and trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins today? If you turn from your sins and turn from your goodness and trust in Jesus Christ, who died for sinners, who took God's punishment on himself that you deserve, and if you trust that he rose from the dead and that he's Lord and treasure and savior of your life, God will forgive your sins. He will give you the power of the Holy Spirit and transform you to live for him for the rest of your life. Are you discouraged this Sunday morning? There is hope. The tomb is empty. The scriptures have been fulfilled. Jesus opens your mind and opens your heart to live for him. And Jesus has made you a witness to his good news. Christian brother, Christian sister, I know life is hard, but don't be discouraged. You might feel like you're defeated by sin, but Christ has overcome Satan, sin, and death. You have resurrection life and power in you. In Christ's resurrection, we have hope. This Lord's Day, just like the very first Lord's Day. Father, take these words and hide them in our hearts that we would not sin against you. Give us hope in your name and in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Friends, we want you to take the next two or three minutes to share with someone around you something that God pressed on you, uh, a takeaway from the story or from the, the message that I preached. So go ahead and um, introduce yourself to someone around you and share a takeaway. We'll take the next three minutes to do that as we prepare for the Lord's Supper. If you're a guest here, feel no obligation to share. Just introduce yourself to someone and listen in on the conversation. Church members, look around for those who might need someone to talk to as you share. And keep social distance.
for a light, but it's also clear. Uh, no, not right now. This is for the paper so that it doesn't blow. Mm, yeah, but no, I have it for outside because of the wind. See the wind blowing the paper? See the wind blowing the paper? If I put this here, and it can't blow the paper. See? That's what I do. Mm -hmm. All right, brothers and sisters and friends, it is time for us to prepare for the Lord's Supper. So if you would turn to page 12 in your bulletin, if you're not a Christian, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to renew our church covenant. So if you're a Christian from another church, go ahead and read along on page 12. This is your commitment to your church family, not this exact wording, but the, but the biblical teaching here is your commitment to your local church. If you're a Christian and you're not a member of a church, you need to have a church where you can share life with the church family in something like this church covenant. And if you're not a Christian, I have an invitation for you. Uh, Jesus wants you to be part of his people. He wants you to have him as your Lord and Savior and have God the Father as your Father. And he wants you to have a church family as your family. So if you're not a Christian, Jesus is inviting you to trust him so that you can have him and his family. And if you ever become a Christian, um, you should find a church that lives this out as best they can, imperfectly, but they try, because um, when you get God, you get his family. That being said, if you're one of the 116 members of Bethany Baptist Church, would you please stand as we renew our church covenant together? If you're one of the 116 members of Bethany Baptist Church, we have some new members for the first time renewing their covenant with us and taking the Lord's Supper. So we have Vlad and Cecilia, we have Reggie and Sandra, and Ricky is over there as well. So welcome. First time taking the church, doing the church covenant together as members and taking the Lord's Supper. We're excited to do this together as, as church family. Although we do have to schedule Ricky's baptism, so we'll do that as well. Okay. Let's begin and renew our covenant together. Having been led, as we believe by the Spirit of God, to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and on the profession of our faith, Having been baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we do now, in the presence of God and this assembly, most solemnly and joyfully renew our covenant with one another as one body in Christ. 
We promise, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit, to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness, and comfort, to give it sacred preeminence over all institutions of human origin, to promote its prosperity and spirituality, to attend its gatherings, to sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrines, to contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel through all nations. We also promise to meditate on scripture personally and with the family, to religiously educate our children, to love our neighbors, to seek the salvation of our family and friends, to walk carefully in the world, to be just in our dealings, faithful in our promises, and exemplary in our conduct, to avoid all gossip, slander, and sinful anger, to use our influence to combat the abuse of drugs and alcohol and the spread of pornography and every other practice which leads to moral and spiritual decay, to be zealous in our efforts to advance the kingdom of our Savior. We further promise to watch over one another in brotherly love, to remember one another in prayer, to rejoice at each other's happiness, to aid one another in sickness and distress, to cultivate Christian sympathy and feeling and Christian courtesy and speech, to restore one another through discipline, to be slow to take offense, but always ready to reconcile immediately in obedience to Jesus, the head of our church. We likewise promise that when we move from this church, we will as soon as possible unite with some other church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of us. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven says, So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself in this way. Let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. And so if you're a Christian, it would be good for you to um, make sure you're discerning the body, that you are fighting sin in your life, that you have declared war on all sin in your life, that you're not at peace with any sin in your life. That's what repentance is. Uh, declaring meaningful war and waging meaningful war on all sin in your life and not making peace or compromise with any of it in any peaceful way. That doesn't mean that you're perfect. It just means you're fighting. If that's you, and you're repentant and trusting in Jesus, we, we welcome you to the Lord's table this, this morning. So if you're a Christian, you've repented from your sins and you're trusting in Christ and you're a member of a church that preaches the same gospel you heard preached here, so you've been baptized and you're a member of the church that preaches the same gospel you preached here. We invite you to take the Lord's Supper this morning with us. Um, so if you're not that, then, then you could uh, ask someone around you what it means to be a Christian. We'd love for you to become a Christian. Get baptized, join a church, and we'll always welcome you whenever you visit us to take the Lord's Supper with us as one of our uh, Christian guests from another church. The Lord Jesus, uh, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread and um, broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. And he took the cup after supper, and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Let's pray and set aside this time to the Lord as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper. Father in heaven, we thank you that you're here now, that your Son is here now, and that your Holy Spirit is here now, that you are here with us as your family, those who have the resurrection hope in Christ. We pray that we would honor you as we eat this bread and drink this cup. Help us to commune with you and to commune with each other. Help us to sense your very real presence here with us, spiritually through us taking the bread and drink and remembering your word, that this is your body for us and your blood given for our new covenant hope. Thank you for this Lord's Supper that we get to take together with our church family and these members present this morning. We love you and we thank you. Encourage us now in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you're going to take the Lord's Supper, just go ahead and uh, line up and go towards Mrs. Ross Kwong that way, and then you can go to Ross at the table. And so if you need hand sanitizer, uh, just go right in front of Christine for hand sanitizer and then walk towards the table. You're going to take the bread and drink back to your seat, and then we will take it together. If you don't need hand sanitizer, that's okay. Uh, grab the cup off of the table. Please don't touch the table. Just grab the cup off the table and Ross will drop the bread in your hand for COVID safety. <laughs> 